well, my name is Porik Nocton. I'm Executive Director of Arts and Disability Ireland. And uh, the other person who I've been talking to there is Sheila Stewart, who's organised this webinar. Uh, and Sheila is ADI's event manager. So welcome to everyone to Access Into Action, uh, subtitling online content. It's wonderful to have 41 of you signed up for today's webinar from Ireland and all across the globe. Um, it's just really exciting how small the world becomes. Um, what was it our Taoiseach said when we, um, when, you know, we all need to, to stay apart to come together. Um, and it's kind of a very interesting example of that. Um, we're delighted to have Ollie Webster, Program Systems Manager at Stage Text, here uh, today discussing subtitling online content. Ollie manages the digital subtitle program and Stage Text's international or internal tech and processes across their programs. Ollie graduated from Durham University with a Bachelor in Science in psychology, uh, did a stint in marketing analysis at a, an energy price comparison website, and then made the move to stage text. Ollie has always been enthusiastic about theatre and the arts, both as an audience member and actor, performing in shows at school, university, the Chicken's Shed Theatre, and Arcola Theatre as part of their queer collective community group. As a deaf person, Ollie has always relied on stage text as a user to uh, be able to enjoy the theatre. So uh, when the opportunity to join the team ap uh, appeared, he knew that's where he needed to be, bringing together the analytical skills he had learned studying science and doing marketing analysis with his love for arts and theatre. In today's 60 minute webinar, uh, Ollie will give a quick overview of online access for audiences who are deaf or hard of hearing, along with a taster of screen, screen text, or sorry, uh, along with a taster of stage text, uh, a longer series of free training webinars um, available to view via uh, the link that's now in the chat box. Ollie uh, will briefly cover some of the reasons we use subtitles, the wider benefits of their usage, some quick tips for improving online access, um, and finally, there will be a 20 minute Q&A session. Uh, Sheila and Amy will uh, moderate the, the questions and uh, call out any um, questions that there are, or that are submitted. Uh, so for now, I'm going to mute myself, Ollie, and it's over to you and I'll, I'll, I'll only uh, come back if you overrun and we haven't enough time for questions, but uh, good luck and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for that introduction. Hi everyone. Um, let me just get my presentation up for you. Hopefully you can all see this. Um, welcome. Hi, I am Ollie. Um, Oliver Webster, and the program systems manager at Stage Text. Um, let's just go straight into it. So, a little background on Stage Text. Stage Tech was founded in the year 2000 by three people who had various levels of hearing loss. Uh, they originally set out to advocate for and support captioning in theatre, but they expanded to include talks and tours in museums and galleries and then digital, which is what I cover. Um, so that in this presentation, we're gonna look at kind of some general access and then more specifically kind of digital stuff because that is what I know. So here's what we're gonna cover, why it's important, who it's useful for, and top tips for practical action. 
first of all, why it's important. Now, I'm assuming that most of you are here because you want to be accessible, so I'm not going to labor the point here. Um, but I'm going to give uh, an overall look at the social model of disability. I've got an image on the screen. I'm just going to describe it. We've got a blue square with the globe in the center. Along the top, you have the text saying, what are the barriers? And you have the text, disabling world over the globe. There are yellow arrows radiating out from the globe and pointing to four labels. The labels say environmental barriers, organizational barriers, communication barriers, and attitudinal barriers. And at the bottom, you can see a faint multicolored silhouette of a group of people. So what is the social model? The social model is a way of looking at disability, people, society, and identifying what causes disability and how that can be overcome and dealt with. The traditional model says that disability is caused by a disabled person's disability. They are disabled and it's intrinsic to who they are. The social model says that disability is caused by the environment, is caused by barriers in the world. That is what disables people, not their own body themselves. So to give you kind of a metaphor to help you kind of understand this, if you have, say, a door that is two meters off the ground and you've got a person who is a wheelchair user and a non-disabled person, and they both need to enter the door, at two meters high, neither of them can enter it. It's just, it's too tall. They just sat there talking about why would anyone build a door that high? Um, so to give access to the door, you build stairs. So now the non-disabled person can climb those stairs and enter that door. They have access to that door. The, the wheelchair user can't. But the two people in this situation are the same two people that were in the situation before with no stairs. They haven't changed at all, but now one of them has access and one of them doesn't. And the reason for this is because the choice was made to build stairs, which is usable by one person, but not usable by another. So the disability of the wheelchair user has been created by that choice to use stairs instead of say a ramp. So this is kind of what the social model says, that disability is created by these kinds of social norms, by the choices that people make about how they implement things and create things in society. To create an inclusive world, you need to dismantle these social norms, these kind of ideas of the way things are done and rebuild new ones which are inclusive to all people. For example, having ramps as the default method for getting between grounds of different height rather than stairs. So for deaf access specifically, um, it's not my deafness or my hearing aids that prevent me from hearing a video, it's the lack of subtitles. I can watch a video just fine if it has subtitles because I can read the subtitles and that enables me to hear it. So the capacity is there for me to watch and hear a video, but when the subtitles aren't there, it creates a difference and prevents me from accessing it. So the lack of subtitles disables me, not my hearing. Um, yeah, disability is caused by a world that is designed by a majority for a majority, excluding those minorities. Okay. Um, so looking at some more sort of specific case studies, I've got another image here, so I'll describe it now. We have a white rectangle with some text at the top and the bottom, which I'm going to go through in a moment. In the middle, we have two rows of five stylized kind of um, icons of a museum. So they look like the Pantheon with pillars and a triangle roof. Next to um, the top row has four orange um, icons and one clear icon with the number 2018 and 19% in brackets next to it. The second row has got three and a half icons that are orange and one and a half that is clear with the numbers 2016 and 27% in brackets next to it. So this is from the State of Museum Access Report from 2018 published by Vocalize. Um, and this was looking at kind of the access provision in museums. And what this report found in 2018 was that one in five, 90%, of accredited museums 
failed to provide any access information online. Now you can flip this and say it's not that bad, four out of five did, um, and this was an improvement on, from 2016 where 27% did not provide any access information. However, as the image says, the detail that was in the existing access information was quite poor um, and often didn't cover anything more than basic information that was relevant for mobility, which obviously does not include all the other kinds of people who have any sort of access requirement that exists in the world. Um, in terms of the impact of this, from you and Guy 2019, in fact, they found that when there is no access information on a website or a venue, 41% of people avoid going because they assume it's inaccessible. And I do the same thing. If I can't find access information, I'm not going. Um, the same report also showed that um, information being inaccurate or incomplete was a big issue. And 77% of those surveyed found the access information to be misleading, confusing, or inaccurate. Um, so this obviously creates kind of a hostile environment for a lot of people. Um, when you're used to things being incorrect or just not there, it doesn't make you feel good. It doesn't, it, it affects your um, quality of life. So it's really important to include access, obviously. Um, from my personal experience and example, because I love to overshare, um, three times a week, I will do a gym workout after work. I know that's a lot, a terrible decision, don't do it. Um, but after this, obviously I will have a shower. Now my hearing aids are not waterproof and also you don't wanna get water trapped in your ears because it will cause infection. So when I have my shower, I will take them out until my ears have dried after the shower, which can be you know, half an hour to an hour, it takes a while. Um, during this time, friends might send me a video, you know, a TikTok or something, um, and this video may not have subtitles despite their best intentions. So at this point, I have a choice and that choice is I can either go and get my hearing aids, which gives me a better chance of hearing the video, but not a hundred percent chance of understanding it. Or I can say, I'm not going to watch that because it's not subtitled. And this is what happens most of the time because I can't be bothered to go and put my hearing aids in for five minutes only to get back out again. It's not worth it. So as a result of the video not having subtitles, it didn't get a view from me. I wasn't entertained and I didn't get to share that experience and discuss it with my friend. So thinking about this from the social model point of view, it, a parallel, if the video had been in Mandarin and with no English transcription, and I sent that to a friend who doesn't speak Mandarin, their response to that video would be the same as my response to an English video that's not subtitled. They wouldn't watch it, they wouldn't be entertained, and they wouldn't understand what's happening. And I've got nothing to do with them being deaf or disabled. It's because the video is presented in a way that is inaccessible to their specific skills. A video without subtitles is being presented in a way that's inaccessible to me and my skills and my way of communicating. That's where the disability and the lack of access comes from. So think about disability in this kind of frame and remember that it's not some tragic suffering inflicted on individuals who are inspiring because they're living their daily life. It's not that. It's due to a world that isn't built for everyone. And we all have choices that we make about how we build things, which means that we can choose to make things accessible and remove disability from the equation. Who it's useful for? Um, now, I go through a lot of this in a lot more depth in the um, full-length training presentation because I have a lot more time there than I have today. So do make sure you go watch those as well to get a lot more from this. But we're going to go through some quick stuff now today. So who needs access? We're going to talk about the different types of deaf people. Um, I've got another image here. We've got um, three rows of black and yellow boxes with some text and some arrows, and I'm gonna go through it all now. So different types of deaf people. We have capital D deaf to start with. So these are a specific group of people who identify as deaf people and the deaf community. Um, they, will use, they usually use sign language as their first language, and they're often born 
um, either completely deaf or with a very significant hearing loss, or they will lose a significant amount of hearing at a very young age, you know, first year, something like that. Because they use sign language as their first language, the best form of access is, of course, signed access. And the point to make here is that sign language and sort of the comparative spoken written language, they're not the same. So English and British sign language are not equivalent. Knowing one doesn't mean that you know the other. They are different languages and they have different grammatical structures. So that's something just to bear in mind. Um, next, we have lowercase d deaf. So these will be people who will lose a significant amount of hearing, but not as much as the capital D deaf group, um, either from birth or kind of early years, but again, maybe not so early as the capital D deaf group. Um, so what this means is that lowercase d deaf, um, this group has kind of either enough hearing to pick up spoken language, or they have some years of experience with spoken language before being becoming deaf. And so they have a little bit more knowledge and skill in written and spoken English. So they will often use lip reading and hearing aids or cochlear implants to support this. Sometimes they can pick up sign language, but not always. Um, yes, the next group, uh, deafened. Uh, so this is people who will lose their hearing kind of quite a bit later on. So middle age, 20s, 30s, so on. Because they spent the first 20 years of their lives or so being a hearing person who speaks in English and not knowing any sign language at all, it's unlikely that they're going to pick up sign language at this point in their life. They're going to continue to use English. They will use hearing aids and cochlear implants. And sometimes they will attend classes to learn lip reading. Um, but it's very unlikely that they use sign language. And then hard of hearing, similar, this is um, people who lose their hearing due to old age. Um, so we all know who this is. This is our grandparents. They're, you know, it's just getting older, the hearing's going. And same thing again, they aren't going to learn BSL at this stage in their life. They're going to use hearing aids and lip reading. So these last three groups, you might have noticed, all have those English skills. So they can, they have the fluency in English, in written English. And so the best form of access is of course, captioning and live subtitles because it is text-based access. It doesn't require them to learn any new skills. This is why um, stage text focus on captioning. We don't include BSL just yet because it provides the most amount of access for the most amount of people. Um, and this is what access is about. It's about people having different skills and different ways of communicating and accessing things. And you have to meet them where they are. The same way as if your audience was primarily French, you might have your instructions in both English and French because a lot of your audience use that. Um, interesting point. In the UK, we use the term deaf, deafened, and hard of hearing people to encapsulate all these groups. But I've been informed that in Ireland, you use deaf and hard of hearing to encapsulate the group. So it's just something to bear in mind on the terminology. Some other benefits of subtitles. So these are other people who also benefit from subtitles. Number one is, of course, accessibility. Deaf people, that is what I'm here for, and that is the main benefit. However, some other people who benefit are people on the autism spectrum. Um, this is due to videos with music and noise, it can cause a lot of sensory overload. And so I've seen lots of discussions on like forums of people who will mute the video and play it with the subtitle and then just watch it from there. People with ADHD and attention disorders, there's been lots of studies that show that subtitles help to maintain focus and attention and to remember things better. And so this is useful for everyone, but also people with attention disorders in general. Family and friends, so um, if something is inaccessible, the people who go with a person who has access needs aren't gonna go without them. My friends say, let's go watch this film. And I say, well, it's not subtitled. They're not gonna say, well, you stay home, we'll go watch it without you. So by providing access to that one person who has access needs, 
you also enable the rest of their group to come with them. Education and literacy. So again, there's been studies that have shown that subtitles help with literacy and learning because it's like when you read to children, they are seeing and hearing the words at the same time. So it helps them to connect that and put it together and learn better. Um, some more benefits, so additional language. We all know the jump from reading a language and learning it to watching someone speak it fluently. And subtitles give people just a bit more time to follow along. Um, academics and enthusiasts. So we have had cases where we've had academics coming to watch our caption performances of Shakespeare because they can then watch the original text and the actor's interpretation at the same time. Um, so it, it just, it's easier than having a script and a torch. Um, more locations, despite the fact that we're all at home right now, generally video is everywhere these days. Um, and so having subtitles means that if somebody left their headphones at home or the headphones in the bag, they can be on the train and they can still watch the video. Boosting SEO. So because subtitles are a text file, algorithms can actually read it. And so they understand what the video is about and so they can recommend it more accurately and also facebook and youtube promote videos with subtitles higher because it, they're, they're encouraging access and then future proofing um, so it's not impossible to believe that one day the government might say everything has to be subtitled and if it's already subtitled you're sorted if it's not you've got a big project on your hand um, and this is kind of shows how subtitles are an example of universal design. You do it for one group, you do it for deaf people, but there's so many other people who benefit. It's not one little thing in the section just for them. Everyone can benefit from it. And no study has shown anyone to be disadvantaged by subtitles. There's no loss, literally. Um, everyone can benefit, the one exception being maybe people who are visually impaired, who don't see the subtitles, obviously doesn't benefit them, but it doesn't, it's not a detriment to them either. So some top tips, quick top tips for practical action. Um, talking about access and subtitles and getting it kind of done in your organization because sometimes it can be a push. Top priority is of course equal access. As I said before, we create the society around us. So we have a responsibility to make that society accessible um, and to make sure that it's equal. Um, so that is that's the top priority. Um, but if that's not enough, um, understanding your audience. So I've mentioned the different types of people who benefit from subtitles. If one of those is a key audience for you, so say one of your audiences is children, then talk about how it impacts literacy and attention. Um, and again, in the full training sessions, there's so much more information there that you can use to target your audience because it's looking at different segmentation. Identify key champions, it's much easier to get stuff done when you've got top-down support. Um, if you can find the sort of important people who decide on your budgets and your agendas and convince them that it should be on the agenda and in the budget, then it's much easier to get it done than if they're saying, you don't have the time for this, cut it off the agenda. So identify them, convert them to the cause, um, win them over, um, and then it's, just, it's easier to get it done. Investment, so everything has a cost, time, resources, money, everything does, but don't focus on the cost of access, focus on the investment and what you're getting from it. What you get is greater access, greater engagement, better reputation, reputation um, and it benefits more than just deaf people, that universal design again. Um, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying anything, but if you monetize your YouTube videos and it gives you better search and optimization, I mean, put two and two together, but I'm not making any promises. Um, enhancing visitor experience um, is access. If something's not accessible, that's detrimental to people who are visiting you, whether that's online or in person. And if they don't fully understand their own access needs or that they have any, then their experience is going to be impacted without them realizing why. It's just going to be, oh, I didn't understand what this was going on. I didn't find it good. And you don't want people saying that about you. So by making things accessible, you improve their experience. Search engine optimization, I've mentioned this before, that's a benefit to you for subtitling things. Um, and future proofing archive, 
um, future proofing, so I mentioned about the legal requirements, um, but also when you subtitle something, it's accessible forever. You've done, you've done it and it gains those benefits indefinitely. You don't have to keep redoing it, it they're there. As long as you keep them together, you're good. Um, best practice for customers. So a concept to bear in mind is this end-to-end -end accessibility. You want your customer journey to be accessible from the start to the end. Um, that means when they when they see a trailer on Twitter and go look at their website, let's look at the event, let's book a ticket, let's go to it, all the way up to the point when they leave your building, that whole thing needs to be accessible. And that often starts online, which is why online accessibility is really important because if it's not there, you're already cutting people off right at the start. Um, linking into this is subtitling all videos. Um, so it needs to be consistent. You need to do everything really, because if you have subtitled just some of them, then it kind of tells people that it's not the priority that it should be. They'll say, why is this subtitle, but not this? And if you've got two out of three videos that you can subtitle, how do you choose which is the one that you can't? And that there is the choice that you're making that disables people. So you really don't want to be making that choice. Um, listing areas uh, that are accessible. Um, so everyone should have an access page. And this is kind of like your general information um, that can be sort of building, a local area, your sort of dedication to access, all these sorts of things. And then on your exhibition and event page, you want specific information for that event. And I mean detailed specific information. Remember what I was saying about information on often being found to be incomplete, misleading, um, or inaccurate. You want to make sure that this is really on point. So say you have a gallery, you can say this gallery has a video. The video has no sound or the video is subtitled. And if it's not there, then you can say, if you would like us to, please let us know at access at whatever.com. Because then you can get that email and you can go to people and you can say, these people want subtitles, let us sort it. Um, training staff be deaf aware. So this is about kind of the welcome, um, but it's also the policy makers um, so that they are incorporating that awareness into their decisions. Um, like we've had, we've had cases where somebody will go to the box office to book a caption show and the person at the box office will say, are you sure you want to go to that one? You know, it's captioned, right? And that, that's like a really hostile um, environment and it, it's embarrassing and it, make, it doesn't make people feel good. You don't want that. Um, another thing, key point thing here, is to make sure that people know what stuff is accessible, as in the stuff, or know where they can find that information. So if somebody comes in and says, what live subtitled tours have you got? They don't just go, oh. they go, well, we have a list here under my desk of all the things that you can access, have a look. So even if they don't perfectly know, they know where to find that quickly so that they can tell people. Um, and in, including it in your marketing materials, tell people about it. If you've got a poster that says, we've got tour dates here between these dates, say, and this date is live subtitled. Make sure you tell people it is a selling point and it will bring people in. Um, and last little tip here, I'm aware that I'm running out of time. Um, so this is the um, subtitle safe zone. Um, this is something that people tend to forget. Um, when you are making a video, bear in mind that subtitles will be going onto it and make sure that the person filming it and the person editing it know this so they make sure that nothing goes in that space. Research has shown that the best place for subtitles is the bottom of the screen um, where these subtitles are in this image. Um, sorry, I need to describe this image. Uh, we have a headshot um, of somebody who's being interviewed for a video and there is a label with their name, uh, Francis Cristola, Marketing and Development Assistant List. And then at the bottom, we've got some yellow subtitles that say Adam came into the office in February this year to give us the training. Sorry, I missed that. Um, yes, make sure that you keep this space clear so that when it comes to putting the subtitles in, they just slot in. They don't cover anything. Um, so have this as a policy. If you're, if you're subtitling stuff, make it a policy that everyone involved in the creation of that video knows about it and knows what they need to do to make sure that it all fits together seamlessly. Um, so with headshots, for example, um, the kind of tip there is to 
make sure you keep the chin clear of the bottom so that the subtitles kind of rest on the clavicles of the person speaking. Um, and then with any kind of labels or images, again, keep that space at the bottom clear, have them raised up a little bit or at the top, just so they don't cover over that. Um, and that's all I have time for. So I believe now we have a Q&A. Okay. Um... Ollie, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And uh, just before we go to the q and I thought I'd just give a tiny little bit of Irish context. I, I grabbed something here just as you were talking. And just to um, remind people that in um, just in an Irish context, um, the number of people with disabilities in Ireland as per the last census in 2016 was... 643,000 people. So it's about 13.5% of the population. Um, and of those, um, 103,000 uh, were deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and uh, 4,226 people who completed the census said they were Irish Sign Language users. Um, and the majority of them live in the Dublin Connor Basin. So not just in Dublin City, but the, the counties around Dublin. Um, so I just thought that might be uh, useful as a context. And of course, we also have the thing in, in so sign language uh, is ISL or Irish Sign Language in the Republic of Ireland and north of the border in Northern Ireland, both British Sign Language and Irish Sign Language are in use. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Sheila to uh, start, or, or Amy, to start picking up the questions for Ollie. And we have just around 25 minutes to run. So we have uh, we've quite a bit of space for, for, for questions, which is great. So uh, is somebody ready to with the first question? Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, Ollie, I might just ask you to turn off your share screen if you don't oh, mind. Oh, yes, please. sorry. No, that's no problem at all. Um, so, yeah, you should have been pinged with the question also, but here it is again. What technology software do you recommend for adding subtitles to videos? One second, it's not showing my um, Zoom thing. Okay, here we go. Um, right, yes, um, what technology? Um, it's a great question because um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, Stage Tech has these training videos where we actually show you how to subtitle. Um, in those training videos, we use the YouTube platform because YouTube has um, this built-in platform where you upload the video and use subtitles directly on YouTube. And it's a really simple stripped back software. So it's great for a starting point to start learning because the focus is you type and you time it. Um, other software can have much uh, sort of steeper learning curves. Um, so the YouTube platform is great. Um, beyond that, there, um, there's pro there are subtitling programs that are more advanced, such as on Mac, uh, there is Subtitle Edit Pro. Again, it's a little bit more complicated, it has a bit of a learning curve. Um, and on Windows, it might be Windows and Mac, but definitely Windows. Um, I think this is the main subtitling software is Easy Titles. Uh, which is spelt E, capital E, capital Z, cap, uh, titles. Um, that's the main one, but uh, again, that is a, a complicated software that is mainly used by subtitling professionals and it has, you know, licensing fees. So recommendations would definitely be the YouTube one. Um, the Subtitle Edit Pro is, um, I think, a one-time cost. It's cheaper, but much more limited. Um, those are my recommendations. Okay, great. Thank you very much. There's some really great recommendations in there. Um, and is there any other questions there from the audience? Oh, um, I think we have one more that's come through. One second now, just opening this up. 
Okay, so uh, do you have examples of, or templates of briefs for subtitling videos that people can use as a starting point? Actually, that's a really great question. <laughs> brief for subtitling videos. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Um, I'm assuming that you mean a brief that you give to a subtitler um, to, to explain to them what you want them to do for the video. Yeah. Um, I don't have um, an example. Um, the subtitles that I work with, we have kind of a standard process, so they just they sort it out. But things to um, bear in mind are the kind of the, the sentence length. Um, so we have a best practice of, I think it's 43 characters per line of subtitle. Um, this is all in the training videos. Um, but yeah, so the sentence length, um, any like names and things that you might want capitalized that would not be common sense to capitalize. Um, so like one, one, one um, venue that I've worked with, um, their name sometimes has a the before it. Um, and so they specifically asked us to capitalize the T on the the um, for the full name. So things like that. If you are burning in the subtitles, which is where you encode the subtitles into the video itself, things to bear in mind are font, font size, font color, background color. Um, yes, that's it, I think. Um, so it's mostly about kind of things that aren't common sense um, and for, for digital subtitles, so the name and all that stuff, and then the appearance for burnt in subtitles. Um, but any sort of good subtitler will ask you these kinds of questions and they'll say, what do you want for all of this? Um, and you can usually kind of check with them um, before they finalize any files you, can, you could ask or they might request that you read through to check that you're happy with everything. Hopefully that answered your question. I think so, exactly that. It's all the kind of little things that you really need to look out for uh, and that in the moment you may not think of. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, we, okay, what hardware uh, slash mobile software would you recommend for subtitling audio guides for museums? What are you guys from museums? Hmm. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna make an assumption that you are talking about the implementation of the subtitles rather than the act of subtitling itself, because the act of subtitling would be the same as subtitling any other video. Um, and I gave the recommendation on some software for that earlier. So in terms of the implementation of it, um, it's a tricky question. So when it comes to audio guides and kind of audio things, to the, where, where it's just audio and there's no video, um, the sort of the easiest thing is to provide a transcript. However, I'm of the opinion that that kind of takes away a little bit of the experience of being in it so my recommendation is to have a blank video that has the subtitles playing on it so that people watching that video and reading the subtitles are experiencing it in the same kind of flow and time as people who had just listened to the audio guide rather than just reading a block of text. So in terms of implementing that, I know that there's apps where you, um, where you can have like you know QR codes or markers on um, items that, that they can pick up on their phone using an app, um, which then plays some media or some interaction. I don't know the names of any of these, I'm afraid, um, but I think that it would be possible to use an app like that to have a page with the video which has the subtitles. And you could use this kind of as the audio guide for everyone. It doesn't have to be that you have to ask for that specifically, because if you don't need the subtitles, you can still play, have the audio playing and just not look at it. Um, so yes, something like that, or even just having um, 
like, you know, you can have like a web page that has the video on it. Tell people to go onto this page on their phone and then they can just load it up and listen to the guide as they go through. Um, this is also uh, good because a lot of people who are uh, deaf, deaf and, or, or deaf and hard of hearing um, will have their own equipment for listening to music. So for example, I don't use headphones. I've got this little doohickey here that plugs into a headphone socket and that plays music to my hearing aids because the headphones just don't work for me. So if I go to a, a venue and ask for an audio guide and they give me some headphones, I'm like, well, not gonna work. If they tell me where I can listen to it on my own phone, I can play it through that. So that's something to bear in mind as well. Um, so yeah, I think that is probably the, a good way to implement it. Have a video with the subtitles that people can access on their own devices. Okay. Great. And yes, that was exactly what they meant, by the way. <laughs> I just Great. didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so on to question four. Um, have you any suggestions to help get all staff in an organization to be more supportive or understanding? We would have some great people who are very interested in inclusion and diversity, but not all of the staff would be. Mm, tough question. Uh, how do you get everyone on board? with access um yeah it's it's tricky because if there was an easy answer to that we could get everyone in the world on board um there will always be some resistance i think just because that's how people some people are i think all you can really do is kind of you know awareness training where possible maybe get involved with somebody in the local area who perhaps um, is an expert or presenter who is also part of the community. So, you know, like, like me, for example, um, I'm a deaf person and I work on deaf access. So involving me, you know, it kind of, you have the expertise and the knowledge, but you also have that personal connection. Um, a lot of times people who kind of resist it's because they don't necessarily know anyone who is disabled. So by giving them a face and a person to kind of say, these are people just like you, it gets them more on board. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of that awareness training, um, like we've had here, uh, there's a lot of it, that kind of information in the, um, the stage tech training videos um, to kind of show you um, about deaf people as a whole. It, a lot of it is specific to the UK rather than Ireland, unfortunately. Um, but there is uh, some information there that you can still use to kind of just show people that we're everywhere, we're people, and we have a right to enjoy life in the same way as everyone else. And by putting effort in, you just make it better for everyone. Not a great answer, I know, but... <laughs> Very um, tricky, very tricky question, though. And I, I wonder, does Pork, do, Pork, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was going to say, just in in um, in an Irish context, I think one of the things that Arts and Disability Ireland does is provide disability equality training, and we very much now work that as a bespoke training, either for uh, a whole venue or organisation, or very often now because we in ireland there are smaller organizations so they don't have a large staff team we bring people together and and train groups of people so for example last year we did uh, training for partner organizations who were involved in our and supporting dublin dance festival so there are various ways of doing it and that can be a half day or a day long training and very often our starting point is is um, in our training is what do you think you need to support your audiences with disabilities? So sometimes the question, can we try and draw out as much of the experience that, and the issues that uh, the venue, the organization or organizations are having and work with them. And another thing we've started to do in our training is maybe three or six months after the training is to go back and do a shorter session and go, guys, 
how was it now that you've had your training? What have you learned? What are still the gaps in terms of delivering your service uh, to your audiences with disabilities? So that's something if you contact Sheila or Amy or, um, or myself or Ramona, you'll be able to get more information on uh, just in, a, in a, an Irish context. And just one brief thing I did want to say, which I forgot to say earlier on, was Ollie compliments on your verbal description of all your slides. As a visually impaired person, I was very well impressed. So thank you. It was really helpful. Um, and actually, Ollie and Porik, we did have a follow-up question, which I've just sent on there as well. Um, is um, Ali, would can you suggest like mandatory awareness training, which is kind of what Porik mentioned essentially? Um, yeah, yeah. So I think actually, Porik, I think kind of thought it, kind of covered that in fact um, with uh, our the training that we do here, and I'm assuming it's something very similar to what's done in the UK. So with that, we might move on to the next question. Uh, so, and that's one question up. Oh, sorry, bear with me as I find my way back. Um, do you have an idea of the kind of budget we might put aside to, to subtitle um, if we don't have the capacity to do it in-house? Um, budget, let's see. So um, it varies from person to person. There are um, companies and freelancers who will subtitle and stage text also subtitle as well. Um, we provide a subtitling service. In terms of budgets, it's, it's, it's tricky because everyone um, has their own rates. However, I would suggest a lot of the ones that you see that might be like a pound a minute, um, it tends to not be that great. Um, what we see a lot of now is people outsourcing subtitling to, um, I think it's it's mostly to like Africa. Um, and so you'll have somebody over there who's subtitling, it's like a, like a subtitling sweatshop. Um, and then you have somebody who will kind of quality check it, but it's just not as good um, because, you know, they don't have necessarily the fluency and also they don't have the awareness of all the little kind of bits and pieces that go into deaf access specifically um, to take the subtitles from just a transcription to accessible subtitles. Um, so I would be wary of the kind of the really cheap ones. Um, in terms of um, what stage text offer, I can, I can give you our prices as a guideline. Um, we have like a kind of, um, uh, our pricing system is we have like a minimum cost, um, at which, it, which is uh, 60 pounds for a video that's under 50 minutes, 60 pounds plus VAT. Um, and that's for digital subtitles, so just kind of text files. And then for the ones that are burnt in as well, um, that is 75 pounds plus VAT for under 15 minutes. And then beyond that, um, for digital subtitles, it is four pounds plus VAT per program minute. And for the burnt in ones, it's five pounds plus VAT per program minute. Um, now we work with really good subtitlers, like the best in the biz, um, but our costs aren't like miles ahead of, they're kind of about the same as a lot of other people that I've seen. Um, so it, you know, it's great value for money. Um, but yeah, I, I was say maybe around that area, I guess. Um, I don't know every single company's kind of rates and people's rates change. And there is a, a way up of what they charge versus what the quality is. So that is something to bear in mind because it's very easy to cut corners on subtitles and it won't be as good. And when you do that, it's bad access. It's not good. And people will pick up on it and they'll say, these subtitles aren't very good. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, great, I think we've got one more question that came in and I think that'll round us up then very nicely. Um, we have about five minutes to run, okay. Sheila. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Um, here we go. Here we go. 
So for, for live Zoom writing classes, so it's a very specific example, how can we ensure access for those with hearing difficulties? Is technology available to provide immediate subtitles? Uh, yes, yeah. so there are live subtitles, which we actually have on this webinar today, provided by Elaine at My Clear Tech. Um, so yeah, live subtitles is something available. Um, we have stage text to provide it, my clear tech provider, and we, we actually stage text work with my clear tech to provide live subtitles. Um, and so Zoom actually has a feature built specifically for this, um, which Elaine is currently plugged into um, to just type the subtitles in specifically. Um, and they use, a, they use a specialist keyboard for live subtitling, not just a regular one. So it's faster and more accurate than if you were just typing it with, you know, a QWERTY keyboard, it's not this one. Um, so yeah, it does exist. Um, and it's been having a lot of demand um, during lockdown. Lots of people working over Zoom, uh, and live subtitles have been a great aspect of that. So yeah. Brilliant, thanks, Ollie. I don't know if there's any more questions out there. But I... Anyone would like to ask Porik and Ollie, you know, um, we have another couple of minutes hey, left. Sheila, can I, can I check one thing? There was a question there that came up from somebody and it was around, uh, I know it's outside the webinar, but just because we have a minute or two, maybe sure. uh, Ollie might like to go to answering it. And it was about providing uh, BSL and ISL access in uh, a webinar or a video context. I think that was the question, if I remember it. Um, let me see where that one was. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll just forward that on. Um, I do believe Amy got back to them, but if Ollie wanted to add anything else to that yeah. question. So uh, yeah, the question was, do you have any suggestions on how to offer both ISL and BSL, or and or BSL for live or pre-recorded events. Okay. Um, well, obviously, what what you provide will depend on where you're doing it, um, and which is kind of used. Um, as we said earlier, in Ireland, it's just ISL, um, and then ISL and BSL um, in Northern Ireland. Um, so, which you use depends on where your event is and who your audience is. Um, in terms of how to offer both, that is a question about kind of technology. If it's pre-recorded, it's not difficult to have a video footage of two interpreters and put them in the corner, maybe with a label. Maybe, maybe just to start indicate which is using BSL, which is using ISL. Beyond that, people will be able to recognize, I think, um, the ones who need to use it. Um, so that's not difficult. In terms of a live event, that is a question for your video mixer, I guess. Um, again, it, it's the same as um, having one interpreter, you just double it up, um, having the, the video feeds mixed. Yeah, it's a little bit outside of my expertise, um, but I don't imagine it will be any difficult, any more difficult. Um, yeah, mm. that, that was the question, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, and then I think we had one more question here. Uh, yeah. So, what are the key information points that should be included on a, an access page on a website? Yeah. Okay. So obviously, there's the obvious. Um, physical mobility related issues. So parking spaces, ramps, stairs. Um, so about getting into and around the building. Um, it's also good in general to have a statement to say, you know, we are committed to being accessible and inclusive. Um, contact information is good. You wanna have both a phone number and an email. An email is good to have one that says access at thing rather than front desk, box office, because it makes people feel like they're going to the right place. Even if it, the email goes to the same inbox, 
it lets people know that this is specifically for your access question. There's been times where I'm like looking at a menu and I'm, I find the email and it says box office at, and I say, well, they won't know the answer to my question. I'm not going to bother. So make sure it says access. Um, and then kind of more general things like there are videos that, that are used. These videos, we always aim to have them subtitled. Um, audio guides have transcripts available. The more general access things rather than specific to an event. So more on the lines of like policy um, saying, you know, we have regular li uh, live subtitled events. We have regular touch tours. Um, there is water available for guide dogs, things like this. Um, what else, what else? I think that's about it, but you wanna make sure that you have all different kinds of access information. So mobility, hearing, vision, um, maybe relaxed performances for theaters, um, these kinds of things. Okay, Ollie, that's that's wonderful. Thank you for answering uh, that question. And just going back to the ISL BSL video, in in some way, in fact, we have we did some tests ourselves around how we might do that if we if somebody asked for ISL because we had it as an option, uh, but nobody took up the service on for for this webinar. Uh, so if you do want to get in touch with Sheila. Uh, we might be able to offer you a little bit of advice, but at its simplest, if you were to have everyone on the Zoom call uh, have their video turned off and uh, just the speaker and the interpreter have their video on, that would be a very simple way of, of running it. And in fact, then the person who's using the uh, IS, uh, ISL would just pin the video as we kind of explained at the start. That's a very rough guide, but it might be a help. But certainly get in touch with us and we can follow up on that. So it's now just for me to uh, to finish. Um, so um, just to say, if you haven't watched um, them already, do make sure to catch Ollie's long series of free training videos, which are available on the Stage Text website. Uh, the link should now be going into the chat box, so you can uh, follow that. Uh, you, can, you can save that link, sorry. Um, our second Access into Action webinar is on Tuesday, the 28th of July, so in two weeks' time, and it's Roz Chalmers. Um, a member of the resident team of describers in London's National Theatre, uh, the, um, the Old Vic Theatre, Chicken Shed, and the Park Theatre, Ros will present writing accessible introductions. Um, so if you're interested in that, places are limited, uh, but you are welcome to, to register for that, as you did for this one. And so now just to do some thank yous, obviously to thank our wonderful presenter, uh, Ollie Webster from Stage Text, Alex uh, Fernie from Atlantic Audio, um, who was providing tech support and recording, uh, Elaine McCarthy from My Clear Text, uh, who provided speech to text and the subtitling, um, and the ADI team, Sheila Stewart, Amy Lawless, and Ramona Mulcahy. And I suppose just to end, thank you uh, for joining us today, because without the attendees, this wouldn't be worth doing. And uh, it was wonderful to have such great participation for ADI's very first uh, webinar. We were slow to, um, to, to, to enter the field, mainly because we wanted to make sure that we had the access right, that we could work with Elaine and, and people from my clear text that we could provide sign language interpreting if it was needed and i also again want to thank and compliment ollie for his wonderful uh, verbal descriptions of his slides which were great uh, so with that thank you from dublin uh, it's been wonderful to have this worldwide audience um, 
from both near and far. And we hope you enjoy the webinar and hopefully we'll catch some of you in two weeks' time. Uh, bye for now. Bye.